All right, my, my name is Gary Shurstad. I'm a tech strategist uh, with Google uh, at Apigee, focusing on APIs. I've been working with Apigee since 2014, and I've been working with APIs a little longer than that. Um, and APIs, and of course, the way we all meet it here. So usually uh, RESTful interfaces that, that communicate remotely over HTTP, but probably 2013, something like that. And what I'm hoping to do today is to talk a little bit about um, service mesh and, and Apigee and kind of bridging that gap between what it means to be inside the mesh and working usually in a microservices pattern uh, versus uh, kind of the the, the the, the traditional experience of building APIs where you've got an unknown audience of developers that you're hoping to attract and you're meeting those needs and kind of what those what those differences are. So I'll go ahead and get started. So I, I think I want to start with a, a definition or just kind of uh, discuss a little bit what microservices are because I find pretty often in when I talk to a lot of customers, they, they, they tend to think that microservices and containerization are somehow the same thing. And of course they're not. To me, a microservice is something that's, it's a small service that's um, infinitely redeployable. So you can identically deploy it over and over again to get the same result. And it's something that controls its own data, right? So a microservice controls the contract to anything that it allows you to read or that allows you to write back. And it creates, and by exposing that contract, you want, you want some way to make that generally consumable. And usually that's an API. But, but strictly speaking, it's not a decision just to go ahead and start using Kubernetes or any other orchestrated um, uh, containerized platform. And what these patterns might look like, so this is an example to show you what we might expect. So you might have a couple of different language nodes that are doing um, performing different types of functions. So on the left here, I've got a node, Node.js node, that's got its own data at rest beneath it, a Java node and a Golang node. And each of these may communicate amongst each other um, in, in order to build a more and more complicated use case. But, but none of them are allowed to access each other's data, right? So they always have to go through that well-known contract uh, in order to, to get access to it. And those services are part of their own deployment description. And where do APIs kind of mix into all this? Well, APIs and, and microservices are, are, are rather complementary. Um, and, and in fact, there's I've done some presentations in the past where I discuss how you move from this kind of monolithic world to a to a microservices world and what that might look like. But, but oftentimes, if we're coming from a green field and we're thinking about the world in a microservices way, it'll look like it does on the right. And that puts up a lot of expectations for the consuming audience in, in with regard to what they're expecting to get out of it, right? They're expecting to see a well-documented list of available services that they can access easily and that perform a function that's uh, that makes sense with regard to the taxonomy, that makes sense with how you've named that particular function and so on. But sometimes we take a monolithic system and we wrap the whole thing up in APIs. And from a consumer point of view, you really can't tell the difference at that point. And, and in fact, that could be a strategy for moving from a monolithic world to a microservices world is take what you have today, that whole estate, even if it's comprised of a small handful of monoliths that um, amongst each other, uh, expose 10, 20, 100 different types of services, wrap those inside their own APIs and create that uh, discoverability and that developer engagement interface that you want. And once that's there, um, you can pivot and begin to re-implement those as a, as a in, in microservices, maybe even containerized microservices if you like. <clears throat> but the needs of these two different worlds really are quite different. So oftentimes, if you're a true microservices developer, um, building uh, microservices and exposing them, you're often very, very close to the, the consuming developer, right? So if I'm building a service and I'm exposing it, that person who's gonna be using it might be right next to me. And, and or it might actually be me myself. So I, I know when I've run projects where I was developing things in a microservices uh, fashion and, and building those APIs, I was building well-structured APIs that I myself was gonna consume when I built my next new service, and the one after that, and the one after that. And, and that means that the needs and the, the, the kind of mediation requirements are very, very different versus when I create something that I expect to have at the edge uh, where when once at the edge, I don't know who the developer audience is. They're not as close as this picture shows me, right? And in that case, I'm gonna need to create a more broadly generalizable type 
a productized version of those APIs that's going to allow access to it. And so that means that we've got governance things to kind of take care of. So from an API management perspective, we want to have a single console for all the API management. I want to productize those APIs in a way that's meaningful to me, no matter whether they're for somebody that's really close to me, right? So myself or people in a, in a, in a, in a team next to mine, um, or if it's a team of developers that are outside of that. Even if it means I might have different types of mediation concerns between those, I still want to be able to treat them as first class products in their own right, right? I probably am interested in quota management. I might have a different quota for the internal team than I do from the external team, but I want to be able to manage them. I'm still interested in analytics, and I want to, some way to kind of manage all the consumption. But the mesh itself, uh, so the actual deployment containerized engine, uh, that orchestration engine, is managing different types of things for me. So it's keeping track of how those runtimes are deployed, it's collecting telemetry information, maybe it's doing mutual TLS. Um, as you'll see here, I can do canary releases, uh, but I can also do things like A-B testing uh, with different versions of a given application. And those aren't, strictly speaking, part of the API. It's a different type of governance that I'm going to use for that. But all these together can be married and conjoined in a, in a system that I'm going to show you guys a little bit later. And so the, the lifecycle concerns kind of remain constant. So just like when we build APIs where we don't know the audience, we want to design first. I'm a strong believer that when we build these inside the mesh and the microservices pattern, we design those first so that we can start with a contract. And that contract leads us to develop, right? So that we can have, um, following that contract, I can start building a service that's going to match that contract. The consuming developer can begin building their service that's going to consume that contract. And we have that in place. We agree on the security constraints. And then we can publish it for wider consumability. Now, in, in a microservices way, uh, world, these are going to probably be published internally. And I've got an example of that here a little later. Um, but we still want to worry about scaling. The monitor and analysis uh, abilities are going to be there. Monetization, usually not, unless you're doing interdepartmental pieces. But it's still a core piece of what we'd expect to be an API management platform. And, and again, we want these to be products, right? So there's different types of developers. We've got these developers that are consuming APIs and developers that are producing APIs. And on either end of those, if there's some kind of product manager that's probably involved here. Now, in, in, as far as Apogee is concerned, the, the world really is a, a, um, a composition of these different APIs that you decide to package inside your own product. We don't want to see the world as um, an external world only addressing external developers versus an internal world only addressing internal developers. Rather, we want to see a packaging of them uh, so that you can reuse these components any way you like, just like you would if you were building actual, tangible, physical products in the real world. Those APIs are those small pieces, those ingredients that go into that packaged, packetized product that you're building. But ultimately, how you expose them and publishing them almost becomes a marketing decision or one done in concert with the product decision authority to kind of make that work. This creates a virtuous cycle that we can build on and iterate on uh, to, to tween and, and get closer to a more um, profitable product over time. So, and all of this, again, is about developers. We want our developers concerned with uh, building some interesting functionality off of the APIs that they're consuming and not about trying to figure out how to use them. Now, again, uh, inside the mesh, those mediation concerns are often a lot less constraining than the ones you might have at the edge, but, but they're still there. So you still want to make it easy for them to find them. You still want to make it easy for them to subscribe to them. Um, and and uh, you want to make it easy for them to begin as quickly as possible building something interesting on top of that API so that they can, in earnest, uh, build something useful for you. And of course, at the end of the day, we care about API management for all the things that you're probably used to, that you've heard a lot about in this conference and others, that we want to make these services discoverable. We want to make it easy for innovation and modernization of whatever you're doing uh, to, to have an outside in approach so that you can get up and moving with this as quickly as possible. And that utilization and how these services are used over time can generate reports that'll tell us how our services are working, the, uh, the adoption of them, the app usage of them, and so on. And, and finally, if we can, we want to monetize them, right? So that we can become a kind of a platform company and, and really use this as a way to, to create a whole new revenue stream that we weren't really utilizing before.
I want to take a minute and kind of explore what I might expect this to look like uh, in a real world scenario. So on the left, we have a number of different types of consuming clients, third party developers, uh, web, maybe spa applications, IoT devices, and of course, in the system there at the top. And these are consuming APIs that are exposed at the, at the API management platform via that gateway there in the middle. And that gateway is mediating those concerns on the far left <clears throat> by talking to a couple of applications on the right. So in the, in the top case on the right, it's an older school SOAP interface. And on, the, on the, the one below that is a some sort of monolith that nevertheless does have a more modern RESTful interface. And, and the mediation concerns here could be many, right? So we, we could be orchestrating a call, combining elements of legacy one plus model of two into some new, you know, more uh, targeted packaged version that the, the, the restful clients on the far left really are looking for. But over time, maybe we decide actually those services could be really useful for some of our own internal applications as well. So we uh, create a, a new version of that, AP, of that API platform. It could just be a logical instance, uh, separate in a different zone of some kind. And we have an internal application that's doing the same thing. So just like those needs on the far left, on the far right, that internal application is also using the same kind of discoverability and the same kind of mediation concerns that were there uh, for, for those use cases that were presumably only for outside world um, adoption. But over time, that internal application begins uh, also to, to use other services that are internal, and those are deployed, and maybe those services themselves are kind of consuming one another as well. And we see here in that in that case, the, those internal applications, they're consuming each other, but they're not doing it under the same rubric and the same wing uh, of, of authentication and API management that the other services are. And that means this starts to get confusing. And of course, at some point, we could decide, well, actually, what we're going to do is we're going to force those calls in this sea of, of emerging complexity in the bottom right. We're going to force those to route back up to the, um, to the API management platform that lies above it uh, so that we can mediate those concerns. And you can do that, and that works OK. But over time, as these grow in mass, that becomes really, really difficult to manage. And frankly, it's from a just a network uh, perspective, it's not a very elegant solution. It would make a lot more sense to localize those API management concerns right to where that runtime is, as opposed to forcing them back up to the larger platform. And if we want to do that, then what we might expect to do is to containerize them, right? So as I said at the beginning, microservices aren't, strictly speaking, a recipe for using containers. Um, but using containers is an excellent way to run them. So at some point, maybe we, we graduate from this, um, this kind of helter-skelter list of, of services that are running all over the place into an organized structure of Kubernetes clusters where we're running um, API management enforcement directly inside that layer. And then as you see here in that case, each of these Kubernetes environments is ultimately referring back to the, under, to the uh, API management platform that lies above them, but that's only for syncing purposes. So we're, we're submitting all the analytics information that's, that, that's occurring from every bit of traffic that traverses those layers back to the API management platform. We're making sure that we're in sync in terms of the applications that we're authenticating for, that the API products that we published are, are the same, and that we're also publishing them as a different gateway. And that means that if we have all these pieces together, we can, can build a, an aggregated view of everything, right? So a single pane of glass for your developers to come and find those, to, those different APIs, no matter where they are, a packetized or product version of them that spans from the Kubernetes environment up to the, up to the, uh, the, the, the edge API platform, if you like, um, and, and of course, a tracking ability for all this over time. So you have these different types of needs, right? So as I mentioned before, for the edge, it's often a north-south kind of need, right? So we're mediating the needs of a northbound consuming audience that we might not even know. Uh, it's very focused on consumption. I've, I've mentioned mashups. So very often you'll see that we, we do build these types of things where we're, we're building a service for a developer that doesn't understand or doesn't need to understand the internal complexities of what the, the internal data taxonomy looks like. Uh, so there's a lot of transformation and mediation and those types of things. But inside the mesh, it's often what we call east and west. And if I'm honest, east and west is a bit of a misused term because east-west could, could really mean anything. But largely what we mean here is uh, you're, not, you're not leaving uh, the, 
the runtime platform where everything else is running. But strictly speaking, as soon as I have my own service that's uh, communicating with another service outside of my business domain, as far as I'm concerned, that's actually north-south. But we tend to characterize these as long as they're inside of a, a given mesh platform as east-west traffic. Um, canary rollouts, as I said, so the, this is where the, the API pieces start to blend in with the mesh because you solve some of these kind of problems in the same way. So I might expect the mesh itself to support a canary bird rollout method, but I might do that implementation via an API. So either that I, I make the changes to the underlying mesh so that can handle it by an API call, or I, I as a target backend system, I expose a different version of that API and I route for it on the ingress coming into that mesh. And often, as I, as I said before, there's no need for this kind of complex mediation that you see in a lot of these use cases. And inside the mesh, uh, at least in the mesh that I'm going to be showing you guys today, this is kind of what it looks like. So I, I have a given pod in, that I've deployed in, in the container. It's got a service on it talking uh, to this proxy that's running, running these individual applications. And these proxies take care of the communication. So if my service wants to, A wants to call service B, it, does, it no longer calls it directly. It calls it via proxy that knows how to communicate with these proxies and, and takes care of that for me. That proxy then can do its own enforcement based on any rules that I've created in the superseding API management platform. So if I've built an API product and I'm trying to do API key enforcement or, or JSON web token or any kind of uh, authentication enforcement, the proxy will take care of that for me so that I, as a developer building service A or building service B, I don't have to care about any of that coding complexity. I simply build the application as I want it, deploy it, and the underlying platform will make sure all this works. And moreover, I can surrender the productization of that to an API product manager that doesn't need to know how this, the complexities of any of this is really implemented, uh, but I can still take and get, get all those benefits from it. And with that, I'm going to jump now and try to give you guys an overview. It looks like I got about half an hour left of what all this might look like. So I'm going to start by jumping into uh, Apogee Edge. This is I work for Apogee, so the demo I'm going to be running uh, today for you guys and where I'm showing you around is based on, on Apogee. The, the concepts, I think, span API management uh, more generically, but um, this is how I'm going to be doing this. So the first thing you see in the upper left-hand corner is that I've got a list of organizations. For us, this organization is just the top level logical container that contains all the other configuration elements that we're gonna be worried about today. Usually when I run a demo, I jump into the proxy section and I show the actual runtime. But today I wanna to start by looking at the products. And you'll see here that uh, I've got a couple of products that I've updated in the last couple of hours, right? So I've got a catalog APIs, a remote service of some kind, internal mesh APIs and external mesh APIs. And if I look at this external mesh APIs, um, you can see I've defined a couple things for it. First of all, I'm allowing, I've got a quota allowing 100 requests every one minute. It's only allowed for internal only. Um, and what does that mean? So that means that this is a product that I'm only going to publish to internal developers. So I don't, I don't want just anybody getting access to this. Um, and I've got, I'm allowing certain paths. And I've got some target names here, an IP address, and notably also this devapi.evils.in. Uh, um, address. Now that address, that host name is the host name of my Kubernetes ingress. So I'm running Istio ingress there, and that's going to be how I get to it for this particular product. Then I've got um, an internal mesh APIs product, and it looks a little different. Where those target API names before had an IP address, an actual globally accessible IP address, and a globally accessible host name. Now I've published some specific services that are available only inside the cluster. And that means that this internal, uh, this internal mesh API is only usable from within the confines of the mesh. I can't call this from outside. So any application that I create based on this product, so any authentication I create based on this product is only usable once I'm actually inside uh, the, the cluster itself. And finally, Last but not least, I'm going to talk about those catalog APIs. The catalog API service is one that I've built that doesn't have any of this extra complexity. So you'll see that I don't have any special paths other than the ones that are associated with the proxies, and I don't have any remote service targets. And that's because for the catalog and products, what I'm doing is I'm, I've built a couple of API proxies 
that are aggregating or doing a mashup of a lot of those microservices so that I can expose that to a third party audience. And I'll go into what those proxies look like in a minute, but I wanted to start with this product overview. So again, just a quick recap. I've got an external uh, product that's allowing me external access to services running inside the mesh. I've got an internal mesh product that's allowing access between services inside the mesh. So this is what we might think of as that east to west traffic container, right? So I've managed to productize that in a certain way. And I've got a catalog APIs uh, product that's uh, productizing a couple of proxies that actually are mashing up proxies that really are available via this external mesh API. So I've got two different layers uh, that I'm kind of exposed to. Let's talk about uh, the catalogs for a minute. So I've, I've deployed all of these uh, proxies into an API catalog in our API portal. So I've got a, the warehouse microservice, the master data microservice, and the price microservice. And then in addition to that, you see I've got a documentation version called catalog microservice, the catalog service. And what I have here is basically kind of a, a simple shopping cart kind of idea. So I've got a I've got a master data service that contains all the master data for the items that I'm that I'm trying to sell. And in my case, I've, I've taken some Saturday morning cartoons from the US from the 80s, <laughs> a, a show called Thundercats. And I've taken different Thundercat characters and created a, a, a fake kind of set of products that I'm, that, I'm per, that I'm selling based on that. And then I've got a pricing service that keeps track of the price for each, of, each one of those wares. And finally, a warehouse service that's keeping track of how many of each of those items that I have. Now for the catalog service, our, our contention is that those that those developers that are coming from outside the organization that just want to build a nice storefront type application, they don't care about the complexities of my system. They don't need to know that I've got three different services that make up how I might build a catalog. So in order to mediate those concerns at the edge, at the I've, I've created an aggregate mashup uh, service that's going to keep track of all those. So it combines kind of all these together into a single payload. Uh, and indeed, if I log in, and I log in as that catalog service, we'll see that I've got an application that I've already built. And then an application is called Catalog App. I've got a consumer, consumer key that I can use to make calls. I'm going to go ahead and copy that. It's, it's approved, it's working, and, and you can see that it's using the catalog APIs product. So that's that product that contains those proxies that are making all that work. So what I'm going to do now, just real quick, so I'm going to jump back, go to API proxies. Let's go look at this catalog service. Go to develop. I'm not going to do a super thorough review of how exactly everything in Apogee works, but I've got a, a, a proxy endpoint section and a target endpoint section. With the proxy endpoint, I mediate how consumers of my API work. The target, I mediate how Apogee talks to whatever the back end is. So we can see here, if I look, that I'm, I'm talking to a back end and then I'm aggregating through, through these policies, these service callout policies. I'm, I'm adding additional calls so I can do more and more work. And then I have a JavaScript function to kind of parse it all together and I've got a cache function there. What I'll do is go to trace, I'm gonna start the trace. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna jump into the API view again, go look at the catalog service and view that documentation. And we'll look at this catalog service. You can see it's calling a MIA POC 15 test. So it's actually making a call to the Apogee endpoint. Let me zoom in here a little bit. So I'm going to authorize that, send it the key, right? So that, that's the key that I've associated with my own application. And with that done, I'm going to try to execute this. And we'll execute it again. We got back a bunch of stuff, right? So we can see here, it made a call, it got back a bunch, it got a payload back in that service. And if I look, we can see uh, I made an options call, I had a brief failure, uh, trying to contact the back end while the cache is warmed up. And the second time it worked and it went through. And if I hit this again, it comes back faster now. And we can see that now I'm getting 304s because the content hasn't changed and my, my cache is actually returning that really, really quickly. So what, what I did is I identified based off that key, 
uh, who I am, right? You can see the, the client ID I sent him. I now know which application it is. I can see the developer email associated with it. So I have all this information available to me now based off this productized version of this API and the fact that I've used this key enforcement kind of grab all that. And this is kind of the traditional use case that we expect to see when we build these kind of things. Okay, I'll stop that. And now I'm gonna jump into the console for a minute and try to show you guys some of that. So what's happening behind the scenes is I've got this Kubernetes service. So uh, I, first of all, I'm gonna use a alias for kubectl and kubectl, if you're not familiar, is just a command line tool that's gonna allow me to get an overview of what my Kubernetes environment looks like. So it allows me to execute commands on my Kubernetes cluster um, uh, and to read from it, to make changes to it, to delete things from it and so on. And so what I'm gonna do is let's get a, uh, have an overview of the nodes that I have deployed at the moment for this Kubernetes environment. You can see I have quite a few of them. So I got a, a two different uh, node pools. So I've got a pool called Shiny Pool and a pool called Cluster Pool. And these pools are deployed on, on Google's Kubernetes engine and are, are used to host all the containers that are deployed. So when I create a, a spec version of any of this, it deploys automatically the Kubernetes scheduler, makes it run for me, and the Apogee rules that I'm associating with it are doing the API enforcement. I've got some namespaces. So I've got a namespace called uh, Apogee, My Services, Mongo, and a bunch of other default ones. And what these are doing are kind of creating an, a, a, a namespace wrapper around any of these runtimes. So if I look at Mongo and I get a list of the pods, you see I've got a Mongo database running there. That Mongo database is what's actually housing all of the the, the product information I showed you guys a few minutes ago. If I look at my services, and I look at the list of pods, you can see I've got warehouse service, client service, price service. I've got a bunch of these different services that I showed you guys a few minutes ago that are that are all aggregated in these products. When I called the catalog service, it called, it in turn called the warehouse service, it called the price service, and it called the master data service, combined the data from each of the services into a single payload and returned it. And that's what you see here in this trace window behind me is the, is the aggregation of all those pieces. But I actually had, to, in order to make these calls, I had to provide some authentication, right? If I try to call them directly, it doesn't work. So if I call, uh, if I try to call the service as it is, it's going to, I get, if I get a 404, if I get to, I get a 403. So I'm getting denied access to that service because I haven't identified who I am. If I want to properly use that service, I'm gonna to need to provide the right credentials. And, and that's what this service is doing here. So if I go into apps, and instead of using that external application that I used before, I'm gonna grab the internal app. Or, sorry, I'm gonna grab the external app. And it's got this key. I'm going to run the same thing that I ran before, but this time I'm going to pass in the key. And now I get back a bunch of JavaScript. I can make that a little easier to read. Like so, I get back a bunch of JavaScript. So you can see I'm, I get the name, uh, the description of who the Thundercats character is, and then a link to a picture showing each one. And by, by doing this now, I'm using this key just like I used the key before from the aggregated version of the app. I now have the same type of security enforcement that localized inside the, the cluster itself. And that enforcement is happening right at the edge of that individual microservice uh, to do that enforcement for me. I also have an internal app, right? So I mentioned this before, There's I do have an internal application uh, that's got its own authentication. You can see it starts with a W and ends with a K here. And that's used to do some enforcement that's east-west traffic, right? So if I, if I log in to a, a pod that I actually have running on the cluster, this curl pod, you can see I've got some commands here. So I'm gonna make a call to the master data service, just like I did before here, but from inside the cluster. And to do that, I have to pass it a completely different key. So I'll do that like so. And if I do this a couple times, at some point I start getting access denied. And the reason I get that access denied is because that internal mesh API product has a pretty restrictive quota. It's restricted to 10 requests every one minute. And so all I had to do was hit that a few times, 10 times or 11 times actually, and it started to block. So 
I'm, I'm using the same control plane to manage not only authentication, but also how I'm restricting access to each and every one of these uh, different services. And as I've already shown you also, I have the same kind of productized portal to keep track of all of them. Okay, and, and, and how could, might this be useful? So I'm gonna show you guys one more thing. So I've got, uh, I'm using a service that doesn't really have anything to do with Apigee. This is a service called Signal Pattern. And what I've done is I've built some collections of these APIs so I can keep track of them in a way. So imagine I, I want to publish these for my mesh user. So I might have a mesh API collection uh, of, of interfaces where I want to keep track of what's in the warehouse, keep track of the master data, and keep track of the prices. So each one of these services is calling those, is calling those same backends that we saw before and pulling back the data. But what I've done now is I've aggregated them into a view uh, so I can look over all that data versus a different type of a collection I might have if I were building access to this at the edge. So if I go into my catalog, Again, I have the same type of service that we saw before, but now I get them, I get back all that data in context. So the name of the first piece, the amount of them I have in stock, the price, and of course that image associated with it from the Thundercats logos that I've been, been taking to build this demo. All of these combine together to kind of provide that data back for me in context. And all this is really doing, if I go into edit mode, all this is really doing is making uh, it's making the same type of, of API calls that I might otherwise be making from, from curl. So go to the patterns, we go look at, um, for example, let's look at, let's look at, look at warehouse, a little simpler one. I'm making a call to that same endpoint. I'm passing in a secret that I've stored and set a signal pattern to access it. And then I'm using this as a simple tool to render that JSON back to me so that I can see that. Every bit of this that you guys have seen me roll up, in order for this to be really workable, also needs to be configurable easily for a developer. And I have every bit of this set up inside a uh, GitHub repository to make this work. So I've got the documentation for every one of these sources that you guys have seen today. I've got specs for all those files, the catalog spec that I've published for use for external users, the master data price and warehouse spec for internal users. And in the portal, I had them generally accessible. Obviously, we could we could create roles around these as well so that I had an internal role that provided access to the master data price and warehouse um, and a separate role for the catalog. But because I had it all kind of inside the same uh, GitHub repo, it ended up being simpler to do it this way. Uh, the Kubernetes manifest for each and every one of these services, master data price, et cetera. I've got a source for every one of these. Uh, different services. And you can see that, for example, this warehouse client API is a Go project versus this master data price warehouse, which are all Node.js projects. Not to kind of make that simple. Um, uh, Apigee config that's keeping track of the configuration of these different API products. So those products themselves that, that we went over with, uh, went over a few minutes ago, are all stored here inside of a JSON file. Here you can see that I've got the master data service, the warehouse service, all associated with this internal mesh API product. And all of this is deployable through automation and in control and controlled by that individual developer. And you want that control so you can make this as easy as possible to maintain. But at the end of the day, everything that you've seen ultimately is, is seamlessly uh, controlled and steered by the same control panel running inside of Apogee. So if I go into API metrics and I look at just a quick proxy overview on performance, we're going to see that I've got a lot of different proxies that have been accessed today. Remote service, which is keeping track of the syncing of information between my mesh and Apigee Edge. That dev API's input for getting access to the, the cluster. Here you can see microservices that are inside the mesh, a product service and a catalog service that are running on Apigee Edge. Um, all of these combine in traffic by proxy in, inside the same analytics overview. So I can control all of it from here. And I think I'll pause, I think I'm about done. Let me turn back here and see if you guys have any questions. We've got about 10 minutes left.
Well, I don't see any questions so far, but let me just kind of try to recap uh, what I was trying to get across to you guys here today. Microservices and mesh uh, computing still rely very heavily on APIs, and APIs are kind of the language and the contract mechanism to make a lot of this work. It's not the only way to do it, but, but I, it's certainly the, the best way if you want to have a tractable consumption model over time to make these services generally consumable. But you still have needs at the edge, right? So you still have, and, and it, the edge was so important that we named our product after it. That's why Apogee's premier product used to be called Apogee Edge. It's because we, we recognize that there was an edge of any given network, and that could be an internal network, but at the edge of any given business domain where you wanted to account for the needs of a consuming audience that you didn't have direct control over, that weren't part of your wheelhouse. And to, to address those needs, you need a lot of mediation abilities. You need a powerful gateway that can meet them. But at the heart of all this is the idea that you can productize uh, both those pieces that are at the edge that are addressing an unknown consuming audience, as well as addressing the needs the, or those developers that you're actually really close to, that stand so close to you that they might be part of your own team. That at any rate, you want to be able to create products that wrap around all of those cleanly and easily, that create documentation for them that wraps around each of them cleanly and e easily, no matter where you're doing the gateway enforcement and make that generally addressable. And what I, what I hope I showed you guys today, that it's pretty easy to use Apigee, uh, both for those edge use cases where you have an unknown consuming audience that's trying to access them, as well as, say, embedding it into the mesh to, to access it there as well, and to create that same type of enforcement, create that same type of engagement through the de developer portal so that the, that, that audience of developers can find and access those pieces easily. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, everything you saw me do with regard to, to publishing um, inside the mesh was done via Envoy. And that Envoy in, in the example I ran today was running inside a containerized platform. You don't have to do it that way. Envoy can actually run anywhere you want. So you can run Envoy and run a, a, that syncing adapter inside a Docker or straight on Linux uh, uh, directly without running it inside a Google platform. Do you have your own servers or do you work with a cloud provider? Uh, so I work with Apigee. Apigee is a, is a Google-owned um, uh, company. We're part of Google Cloud. So everything that I did today, I ran on GKE and using uh, a cloud version of, of Apigee to do this. Um, our customers run uh, and all over the world and in many different environments. So we offer this on-premises. Uh, we offer this in multiple clouds. And, and um, yeah, you can run us. We'll, we'll meet you wherever you need us to run, quite simply. Retrofitting Apigee existing API system. Is there a path to gradual tested migration? Um, the thing is, I, the, this is kind of a, there's a technical answer for this, but there's also just as much, I think, a business uh, answer to this question. I Adding adding any kind of proxy layer, forget Apigee for a minute, adding a proxy layer that's easy to configure uh, on, top of your, on top of your services is a great way to give you the ability to pivot um, so that you can pivot and change and update and modernize, um, you know, how these backends work so that you can uh, change how your organization works. That could be because you're moving from monoliths to microservices. That could be because you're moving from on-premises to cloud. <coughs> or it could be a mixture of both, right? Um, that's a great way to do that. I, I, using Apigee specifically for that, I think it's great because of the whole product concept. Because we can, we will productize these. You can track the ones that are working and focus on those before moving on to the ones that aren't. And it also means, and I think this is really important, that it gives a focus on the right business strategy to get this to work. No one cares if you do something really technically difficult that has no business impact. I mean, I hate to say that, but I mean, some people care, but the, the business isn't going to care. But a, a lot of times the best path forward is to do a fantastic change that the business cares about um, in, in order to gain momentum to, to continue that process. And then whether that's retrofitting or modernizing, um, it, it's kind of in the eye of the beholder, to be honest. I, I, I don't know if that, that helped, but that's my, my answer for that. Okay, great. Well, I'll be here for a few minutes. Uh, I'm seeing if you guys have any other questions. If not, um, thank you very much and have a continued great conference.
Oh, self-learning and studying. Yeah, you know, Apogee has outstanding resources. We have our own YouTube channel. We have a very well-documented uh, set of use cases for working with this. And we're frankly uh, very large contributors to Istio and the open source community, which is also very well-documented. I, I I think if you go to our to our booth in the uh, Partners Village, uh, we have some information there uh, about that. But if you look up Apogee in YouTube, you'll find our, our YouTube channel. And we've got a great community website as well uh, where you can have forums to ask questions and so on. It's, it's really, really easy to get started and get running with all this stuff. And if you like, by the way, the, the rather comprehensive uh, demo that I ran today, which com combined all kinds of things, is available in my public GitHub. Uh, um, it's, it's Right now, it's in a branch called Envoy Adapter. But in the next day or so, I'll be merging all that in, back into my master. Sure. My pleasure. Looks like that might be it. Um, in that case, I'll give everyone about five minutes back. Thank you very much for um, uh, sitting through my presentation and uh, uh, feel free to join us in the Partners Village if you'd like to learn anything else. Thank you. Bye-bye.